Okay, so today we're going to begin our new unit, Unit 5, Sectionalism and Reform. And Unit 5 is rather large, so we're going to break this up in two parts. The first two slides you're going to see, you do not need to take notes on. Um, if you're using this for the purposes of taking notes, if you're using it for the purposes of review, then just listen. So, Sectionalism and Reform. We're going to cover... A, instead of like covering a president or what goes on in a president's uh, time in office, we're covering instead pretty much everything that happens from the writing of the Constitution to the Civil War. So that entire period is known collectively as the antebellum period, and ante means pre, bellum means war. So for part one, we're going to look at kind of different things, like say, than, than necessarily what a president did. 8.34 standard is called King Cotton, and Memphis is the cotton capital. 8.35 is the antebellum South, talking about Southern society at this time. 8.36, conditions of enslavement, and how the slaves resisted. They resisted two ways, passively and not so passively. And finally, the American Industrial Revolution, the inventors and inventions that you need to know. So as I mentioned also, uh, besides that intro slide, which you normally do not write except for the heading, you don't need to write this. This is a review. You have already seen this diagram. This diagram is of a slave ship trying to show you the conditions. The top picture shows the bottom, which is uh, not going to be for actual cargo. That's where they're going to kind of weight the ship down and things of that nature. That's not the area they put them in. And then you start seeing how the slaves were stacked they were laid shoulder to shoulder, chained up, could not move. They were chained, chained across your chest, chained at your feet. You weren't even allowed to sit up. About 20 minutes a day, they would take you up topside, feed you, check your condition, and then put you back down. So at the time of the Constitutional Convention, okay, 1787, key year for America, September 1787 is when we get the Constitution uh, signed, sealed, and delivered. It's got to then be ratified by the 13 states. But at the time of the Constitution, Northerners assumed that the evil of slavery was dying out and would, by degrees, disappear. Now, that is the way it is stated by Roger Sherman, who is the man who gave us the Great Compromise, which set up our legislature, if you recall that. And he said slavery is not a good thing. He's called it evil. And he said it's dying out and will by degrees disappear. <clears throat> but to get the Constitution okayed by southern states of Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina, they had to promise, they being the writers, the framers, the Constitution, had to promise that slaves would be allowed to be brought from Africa to the United States until 1808. Now, that's, again, going along with the idea of men like Roger Sherman that, hey, slavery is going to go out. It's economically infeasible. And so eventually it's going to go away. Slaves, to remind you, have to endure the brutal middle passage. This is uh, the, when they're on these ships, they're crossing from Africa, crossing the equator to America. So they're down in the, in the area of the Tropic of Capricorn. They're going to go up to the Tropic of Cancer and... Um, Man, I mean, that's just, if you've ever been there, I've been on a, there on a cruise ship that was air-conditioned, and I can't imagine being there in the conditions these people were put in. At the, top of, at the time, 1787, the main cash crop is tobacco, and cotton production is really non-existent. Cotton is just not a crop that anybody likes to deal with at this time. Main cash crop is tobacco. When you see a map, of where the slaves were at this time. The slaves are up in the Virginia area primarily. So next we're going to talk about Eli Whitney's big idea. Eli Whitney is an out-of-work graduate of Yale University who travels south in 1793. He begins actually his travels to be a tutor for a uh, plantation owner, and he changes up in midstream to try to study law. In the meantime, he visited plantations and he was told that, you know, cotton, the problem with cotton is I can get a man to harvest 50 pounds of it, but it takes another day to get the seeds out of one pound. 
So he thought about it and put his brilliant engineering mind to work and invented a thing called a cotton gin. It's a labor-saving device that helps preserve the weakening arguments for slavery since cheap, i.e. free, slave labor is needed to pick cotton. What the cotton gin actually does, it's a mechanical device. It cleans the seeds out of cotton. A small cotton gin, such as the one that he first produced, can clean 55 pounds of cotton a day compared with one pound without the device. Now, he showed his device off to several plantation owners. They had carpenters. They had people who uh, were a part of their contingent. A decent carpenter could slap one of these things together in a day. And once they saw how it worked and he did not get it patented, he doesn't really make any money from this device. But the cotton gin, because of a big key idea here, is why it's all in bold print. Because of the cotton gin, more slaves were needed on ever-growing plantations where work became more regimented and more relentless. So cotton becomes now the main crop, and what you need is you need acreage. You need more land to grow this cotton on. So now we want to increase the size of our plantations, increase the number of slaves. We're going to regiment the work. We're going to make the slaves get up at dawn, go to sleep at dark. All day long, they're working, picking cotton. And uh, the, the cotton gin looks really uh, it's kind of like a little thing, no big deal. But when you see one of these in larger size, you see what the work would have been like. Of course, you have to turn the wheel by hand. There are no electric engines or even steam engines that are going to power the thing. So you're cranking this by hand. You see one man cranking. You see another man pulling cotton out or pushing cotton in. I'm not sure which way it's going. Um, you see women around, women about, and uh, the cotton gin requires more and more people. Uh, you got to have a lot more people to pick the more acres of cotton. You got to have more people to run the gin. So although it makes work easier, it uh, the gin needs people to make it work. And so the demand for slaves increases. Uh, now, Eli Whitney again comes up with this device in 1793. We're going to stop slavery altogether in 1808. We're going to quit bringing Africans in. So there's a there's a real urgency, a real uh, need to get as many slave ships into America as possible. Now, bear in mind, in 1808, according to the Constitution, you cannot import slaves from Africa. As you should remember, Americans are very good at smuggling. We got good at smuggling when we were trying to avoid the English taxes, and we've not forgotten. So although slavery is technically no longer slave, sorry, the importation of slaves is technically not supposed to happen after 1808, you can bet that it did happen, just under cover of night and in secret, and, of course, illegally. If you were caught with this, you would be in deep trouble. So that doesn't mean it stops, though, not completely.